I am representing Diplo Foundation, Malta, and um, I'm a fellow of the Capacity Building Program 2006. It's uh, about internet governance, it's mainly for developing countries, and um, it's based in online, so it's a, basically e-learning uh, program. We are participants from different parts of the world, including the Far East, and North Africa, Europe, uh, the, the Pacific, and uh, the course is based on uh, a book written by uh, Jovan, who is the director of uh, Diplo Foundation. We had the chance uh, to cover different issues. The course is mainly divided into baskets, including the infrastructure basket, uh, social and cultural, economic. It's dealing generally with all the issues uh, covering internet governance, but mainly for developing countries who are in need of um, uh, internet governance system. Yes, the main focus was on developing countries. So basically, we were participating and setting up all the issues that we face in our countries, and we were sharing knowledge. The issues were diverse and are different from one part of the world to the other. For example, uh, issues of privacy and uh, freedom of expression were more relevant to the um, Asian part because we know all that China is implementing certain regulations concerning freedom of expression in cyberspace. In other countries like Latin America, we know that in this part of the world there are some political problems. So. It was more about policy, and um, it, it was like that. The course was, was divided like that, and everybody has some knowledge to share with the other. But the main, the main point in the, in the process was, was, to, was to come up with recommendations and, uh, and opinions as well, how we would shape and how we would be able to establish a policy in order for, for, for internet governance sake. It wasn't, it was exchanged between the students and monitored by tutors in order to set up policies for internet governance. So it was not basically academic. For me, in my opinion, internet governance, it is relevant to, to speak about internet governance mainly for developing countries because that's where you see that there is a discrepancy in many, in many parts. For example, uh, in developing countries, they have all sorts of, problem, of problems, including access to information, including uh, affor affor affordability. Uh, that, that, that's the main issue. I, I, I don't see really to what extent talking about internet governance is relevant to developed countries. Actually, yeah, exactly. So uh, the, the issues are, the, there are priorities. Each country has, or each part of the world ha has its own priorities. For example, when we speak about internet governance in, in the States, it's completely different uh, wh when we speak about internet governance in Africa. So the uh, Africans, they have other priorities. They're, they're still struggling to get the access to information, uh, the costs as well. And then we, we speak about policies and how we can regulate the spectrum. But the problem here, we are trying to do this hand in hand like everything, like set up uh, the appropriate uh, telecommunication infrastructure, um, make sure that it, it, it is affordable, and at the same time set up the policies in order to regulate the whole spectrum. So uh, as for the Americans, anyway, the North, if you want to, to make the division, the North and the South, so as for the North, there are other priorities, like how to, uh, how to make uh, the Internet more, and not free, but regulated in, in a sense that it's not, it's not abused. For example, there are, everyone, every part has its own priorities, so. Um. Uh, 
Uh, well, if you want to divide the responsibilities of different multi-stakeholders, there are three main stakeholders in the internet governance issues. Uh, there is the private sector, which is an, an important component because it includes the uh, telecommunication operators and uh, corporations, software corporations. This is the basic because without a computer, without you know, a, a, and the, how shall I say, a good in telecommunication infrastructure, there is no access. Without a software, we won't be able to have you know programs in computers. The second important uh, multi-stakeholder is uh, policymakers, governments, institutions. Uh, I mean, official institutions. They are responsible of setting up. Uh, regulations and uh, legislations for a fair use and for a regulated use of internet. The third multi-stakeholder are uh, the organizations and uh, these organizations in my opinion who are more involved in capacity building programs in raising the awareness of the importance of internet and its impact on development. So this part of the multi-stakeholders who are more you know, who are doing basically the, the, the hard job, raising the awareness of the people, making sure that it's understandable to what extent internet access can participate in the development of a country. Uh, I see, I, I, there was a question that I asked yes, yesterday about to what extent actually the private sector is willing to help in, technically speaking, and financially to support countries, who least develop, developed countries, to have access to internet as a basic as a basic component, you know, to, to participate in development. And to what extent the, the, the other part, the, the other important multi-stakeholders, governments, local governments, are willing to set up flexible legislation in order not to make it too complex for people to have limitations using the internet. So the interrelations between different multi is, is complementary. I see that everyone completes every job, every task of a, a certain multi-stakeholder completes the others and it relies in a way or another on the, the work of the others. That's how I see. So that's why uh, some people think that the whole process is too vague, but I see it very clear. There are three parts and they can work all together to come up with the final result that make it more clear. That's why there is this ambiguity around <laughs> what's internet governance because I told you before that there are priorities. Everyone has priorities, but we still can shape a system, a flexible system that is, you know, covering many areas at the same time, but the, but the parties responsible for making it happening are very clear. Governments, private sector, and the the last one is the NGOs or the, the other important team. <laughs> In fact, my, my question wasn't answered. Uh, I was expecting an answer because actually all the, um, the multi-stakeholders which were supposed to answer these questions were present in the panel, but nobody could. Nobody could because the private sector, as you know well, telecommunication infrastructure, corporations, giant groups of, you know, they, they have a business, uh, mainly business scope and the whole affair. Uh, they won't be able really to finance the digital gap of the um, African countries or developing countries. Obviously, their, their plans, their agenda is different from uh, from what we are looking for as an NGO. So um, this, this is very difficult to reach. That's why discussions, discussions are meant to be done. Not, it's not me, I have a proposition for example, but it's not really affordable. Like, uh, how shall I say, it's, it's like a dream. It's like, it's not possible. I won't, I won't ask Vodafone to go to Zimbabwe to, to set up networks for free. That's not possible. That's why they need to maybe study, you know, to what extent they can help, what's their limitations, you know? So that's, uh, that's how I see it. <laughs> Well, I think that the main issue is that, as I, I will stick to one point, is that I said that 
there should be an establishment of flexible procedures. That's that's uh, what I prefer, like uh, a resolution, like uh, a recommendation. Maybe they can take it into consideration, like set up set up regulations, but flexible regulations. Don't limit the choice of the user in terms of freedom of expression, in terms of uh, e-commerce platform, which is flexible for everybody, you know, in terms of transactions and all that security issues as well. So that's how I see it. Yes, even in the transactions, for example, I'm expecting an American company to accept uh, transactions from uh, uh, Ethiopia, for example, or, you know, give the chance to these people to have access as well to, th to these services because uh, at that point uh, today, uh, I don't think there is a, any bilateral exchange in terms of transactions between Ethiopia and the States, for example. Why? Because there is not enough confidence in the Ethiopian economy as a, a very, very, on the bottom of the line of uh, at the economic level worldwide. So that's why there is no trust between the two countries. Consequently, people from Ethiopia cannot benefit from a commercial exchange between uh, with the states, for example. That's an example. Why? Because of different other issues. Because Ethiopia, they don't... I'm just giving an example, but uh, there are many countries who are in the Pacific, in the in Latin America suffering from the same uh, limitation. My biggest hope is uh, would probably be unreachable <laughs> because uh, I believe in something as um, I know that, for example, um, some other countries, as I told you, they have priorities. There are many other issues that should be addressed first before talking about internet access, mainly electricity, uh, health issues, uh, HIV for Africa, uh, you know, the other priorities. But I believe that internet access will help a lot in order to bridge the gap, not only in, in, in internet, but bridge the development gap in general. So people, if they have access to internet, they can generate a lot of benefits. My biggest fear would be that the, uh, the globalization of making internet uh, global, like everybody will have access to internet, is the cost. And I'm afraid that, I'm not afraid, actually it's a fact, that uh, people who are responsible to provide this access are not willing to sacrifice a lot, are not willing to give up their business, uh, you know, business hopes or business strategies in order to help developing countries to have access to internet consequently benefit from it as a mean as a as a major mean now to to guarantee development so there is this the cost of setting up a whole infrastructure which is a lot of money i can i can i can understand but at least they can they can help in reducing the costs for these people to have access to the information because it's very important now to have access to the information first and then later on we see other issues. The future of internet is very, very promising. So promising. Promising, yeah. I see a lot of potential in, uh, in the future of internet, but uh, it's obs obscure <laughs> as well. It's, it's not uh, very clear. And the proof is that here, the first meeting, we, um, we were in the discussion. I felt that we're still coming back to what's being said in Tunisia and Geneva. There was uh, no, uh, I didn't see any initiative to take all the process one step further till yesterday. That was the opening and um, I'm, I was expecting like what, have, what was done from Tunisia to now. I was expecting to see a frame, like a result, but till now we didn't see. We'll be discussing the main, the main issues, the main four issues, and we'll see if people were able in this during the, this year to come up with recommendations in order to improve, in order to you know set up new things. We want to hear new things. I don't know if all 
the present multi-stakeholders have this idea in mind, but um, I'm looking forward to hear new recommendations for this field. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.